Hi and welcome to this video on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and today I'm going to talk to you about the theme of love and marriage. Very similar to some of the other videos in this playlist and or you know similar kind of links to them so do make sure you check all of those videos out. When aiming to understand an author's viewpoint on such a vast topic as love and marriage it's important to consider the whole picture presented in the text. The first place to start I think is with the obvious examples of what does not constitute a good example of love and marriage. The novel begins with the highly famous and highly amusing statement that it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. That this comment comes from the narrator and not one of the characters suggests this viewpoint is the absolute truth rather than a matter of opinion, although clearly there's some sarcasm in the line. So the first thing we learn about love and marriage is that it's often based around material wealth and success. Now when Mr Bingley moves into the neighbourhood, it enthuses Mrs Bennet, who's thinking of his marrying one of her daughters. But it's worth stopping at this point and considering just what we know about Mr Bingley in this opening page. And really there are just three things. Number one, he's young. Number two, he's rich. And number three, he's single. Mrs. Bennet and the reader with her know nothing at this point of his character, his personality, his education or his looks, but it doesn't seem to matter and therefore we can conclude our first point that marriage is based mainly on wealth and position. We might be willing to disregard the wild notions of Mrs. Bennet, who's always exhibiting one extreme emotion or another, but we can't ignore the actions of Charlotte Lucas, who always seems to speak a bit of common sense really. After his rejection at the hand of Elizabeth, Mr. Lucas is successful in acquiring, uh, sorry, Mr. Collins is successful in acquiring the hand of Charlotte Lucas in marriage. And this shocks Elizabeth to the core, as Mr. Collins is clearly a ridiculous man. And when Charlotte senses Elizabeth's disbelief in chapter 23, she explains, I'm not romantic, you know. I never was. I ask only a comfortable home, and considering Mr. Collins's character, connections and situation in life, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as, as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. Now there's a lot you can take from Charlotte's speech here. To begin with, the phrase, I am not romantic, seems to set romance and marriage apart as two separate ideals. If romantic may be defined as preoccupied with love, it seems marriage and love need not go hand in hand at all. Charlotte clearly desires social happiness, a comfortable house and a life in high society. And this ties in with Mrs Bennet's opening comments about the marriageability of Mr Bingley, who himself has a good home and high social circles. Whereas Mrs Bennet and Charlotte Lucas are accepting of this notion of marriage, Elizabeth is not. We see this most plainly in her refusal of Mr. Collins's proposal in chapter 9, with the reasoning that you could not make me happy and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who would make you so. So it's clear that Elizabeth looks for more than social status in marriage, instead looking for happiness. What might this happiness look like? We gain further understanding near the end of the novel when Elizabeth speaks to Lady Catherine and explains, I have only resolved to act in the manner which will, in my own opinion, constitute my happiness. The level-headed Mr Bennet questions Elizabeth about her final acceptance of Mr Darcy, admitting that he is rich to be sure and you may have more fine clothes and fine carriages than Jane, but will they make you happy? And once again, happiness is placed in the utmost importance here. However, Mr Darcy doesn't fall in love easily. When admiring Elizabeth early in the novel, we learn he really believed that were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he would fall in love with her. Yes, Darcy himself is prejudiced towards the lower classes, hence the title of the novel. However, his journey throughout the course of events is transformational and he ends up admitting to Elizabeth that As a child I was taught what was right, but I was not taught to correct my temper. I was given good principles, but left to follow them in pride and conceit. Unfortunately, an only son, for many years an only child, I was spoiled by my parents who, though good themselves, my father particularly, all that was benevolent and amiable, allowed, encouraged, almost taught me to be selfish and overbearing, 
to care for none beyond my own family circle, to think meanly of all the rest of the world, to wish at least to think meanly of their sense and worth compared with my own. Such I was from eight to eight and twenty, and such I might still have been but for you, dearest, loveliest Elizabeth. What do I not owe you? You taught me a lesson, hard indeed at first, but most advantageous. By you I was properly humbled. I came to you without a doubt of my reception. You showed me how insufficient were all my pretensions to please a woman worthy of being pleased. So Darcy is able to come to the realisation that he was wrong to care for none beyond his own family circle. So although Darcy began with misguided notions of love and marriage, he came good in the end and realised that love conquers all. Of course, Elizabeth and Mr Darcy are not the only characters deeply in love. We can learn much from the relationship between Jane and Mr Bingley too. The falling in love between Jane and Bingley is almost perfect. Although Bingley's sisters feel the match is not appropriate due to class, Bingley offers some excellent opinions on the topic. When his sisters are mocking the fact that the Bennets have relatives in Cheapside, which is a poor part of London, Bingley argues if they had uncles enough to fill all Cheapside, it would not make them one less one jot less agreeable. And Bingley's point here is clear. Social class and wealth do not affect how good or likeable a person is. His character sharply juxtaposes that of Mr Darcy to begin with, although by the end they both end up marrying Bennet's sisters. So what is Jane Austen saying about love and marriage? Well, to begin, she's criticising those in high society who would marry for position, wealth and social status. And secondly, she's arguing that one should marry for love and romance. These morals were carried out in Austen's own life, even though they meant that she never did marry before her death. So I hope you found this video useful. Please do subscribe to the channel. More coming soon.